continuing our exhaustive and perhaps exhausting study of chord inversions and their practical applications in chord progressions, I'd like to cite some examples of ways in which successful pop songwriters have used a second inversion minor chord, that is, a minor chord with its fifth in the bass. Like its first inversion counterpart, second inversion minor chord has a dark quality that to me sounds bleak and ominous. Ooh. And uh, it's a little darker than its major counterpart, the second inversion major chord that we looked at recently also. So it's not used nearly as commonly in pop songwriting as its major counterpart, but it's very effective. In music, like in any other art form, you need contrasts to tell an effective story. Major chords, vanilla ice cream, and blue skies alone won't create drama. Outside of classical music, the first example that comes to mind of a great application of a second inversion minor chord is the second chord in A Day in the Life by the Beatles. Strumming his acoustic guitar, John Lennon begins a song and each of its verses on an open G chord and proceeds to walk down to E minor via B minor over F sharp. The thoughtful, brilliant composer could have just as easily played a straight B minor, which is very angular, or the more cliche passing chord D over F sharp. That sounds a lot tamer, doesn't it? And a little too much like Freebird, which incidentally wasn't written yet. So you have a G chord, B minor over F sharp. And what I'm doing here is I'm actually not barring. I'm just fretting the low F sharp note and then arcing my index finger over the strings and using the bass of it to fret the high F sharp note. And then using these three fingers to play the B minor chord as you ordinarily would, but I'm intentionally muting that a string, the fifth string. So instead of getting the, to me that sounds a little too muddy in the low register, you know, having that. So you have, you get the, it's like an F sharp strummed octave on the bottom, and then with the regular B minor chord. He goes to E minus seven, and then I think he goes to C, C over B, A minor, minor seven or maybe a minor nine I read the news today oh boy beautiful that one little chord change you know it just gives it nice darkness that it needed a few years after the Beatles broke up Bruce Springsteen penned what many including yours truly consider his greatest masterpiece born to run and he used a very similar move in the key of a kind of like this Okay, I'm referencing the pre-chorus section of the song where he sings Sprung from cages out on Highway 9 That part, Highway 9 We have an A chord and then C sharp minor over G sharp And we're doing the same thing we did a moment ago with the B minor over F sharp You know, I'm not fingering the, not pressing down the bar It sounds a little better up there because you're a whole step higher To me, that sounds a little muddy, so I would rather do like the strummed octave on the G sharp notes. So it's from cages on a and he goes to F sharp minor, back to C sharp minor over G sharp, and then a nice welcome E chord. D over E or E9 sus4. Another goosebump-inducing example of a second inversion minor chord's use in a pop song in a different kind of way can be found in the band classic The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down, which we looked at recently when we were talking about second inversion major chords. Here I'm referring to the pre-chorus. It's pretty early in the track, I believe on 16 seconds into the track, and we have something like this. Okay, we have an A minor over E chord. What I'm doing here is intentionally muting the A string with the tip of my middle finger, which is fretting the D string. So this way I can strum across all six strings and have the low E and then nothing on the A string. And then E, this is just like what we did a moment ago. We did this and we were muting the fifth string. Well, we're doing that again, but now we're doing it with this finger. So this is on the lyric. In the 
Top 65 And then we're into that beautiful chorus. Okay, so one more time, that's A minor, but not playing the A string. Change of quality, is what they call it in classical music. Um, now some options here, instead of doing that, you could just hybrid pick, you can go. You're getting a more pianistic simultaneous note attack, but you can only do four notes at a time, right? With the three fingers, unless you eschew the pick all together and just go. So now I got the low E string and the top four strings with my four fingers. So I can play five note chords. But I kind of prefer to use a pick because at some point you're going to want to strum the rest of the song. Another option is to just play an A minor bar chord, but don't bar. I mean, bar only the top two strings, the mini bar. And then so now you have your low E, so you can go. As opposed to doing this with the muting. There's your ominous bleak sound, right? He's talking about the winter of 65, you know, the, Darkest Days for a Confederacy, right? Great example of the chord matching the lyric. At the risk of being verbally stoned to death by you guys for citing yet another oldie example, I'd like to briefly point out the verse section to the Simon and Garfunkel folk rock classic Homeward Bound, which uses the second inversion minor chord in a different kind of way. Okay, here, guitarist Paul Simon is capoing at the third fret, which he does often. He's playing G, but he's just using these bottom three strings, creating like a low register bass voicing, G, and then here's your B minor over F sharp. And then we have B diminished over F. And then E7. And then you play A minor. But what Simon does is he arpeggiates it. Something like that. Um, interesting, you know, the second you arpeggiate chords, it transforms it from just like a blah chord, chord, chord into like an interesting accompaniment apart for a song, you know, just eighth notes. Interestingly, this is sort of like a day in the life we looked at earlier without the capo where John Lennon was going G, B minor for F sharp, okay? so. Simon's using a much lower and very sparse economical voicing. And then B diminished over F, E7. And it continues, very nice. These first couple of chord changes also bring to mind something a little more recent. The um, piano part that begins the Motley Crue song, Home Sweet Home. And the voicings are basically like this on guitar. So we have a C chord, I'm going to do like the Jimi Hendrix thumb fretting thing instead of a bar chord. That's E minor over B. That's the same grip we looked at earlier. We had F sharp minor over B. We had C sharp. I'm sorry. We had B minor over F sharp. C sharp minor over G sharp, right? And now we have E minor over B. So we go from C, and then E diminished over B flat. F over C. If you don't want to do the thumb thing, I can understand it. Some people can't deal with that because of either their hand or the shape of their neck. Maybe your guitar has broad shoulders on the neck. It's like one of those U-shaped. So you can just do this. 
Let's make the bar chord then, okay? And then pluck it, hybrid pick it. And this one's a little bit of a stretch. Okay, so your second inversion minor chord comes in here. There, it's E minor over B. Now, what if they just went... It sounds the same, but different. I mean, it's got that... And then... B flat diminished over... Yeah, see, that would be... Everything in root position kind of sounds, eh. It's cool, but you know, inversions are what give things that nice like, floaty quality. One final example for today's lesson, and this features the use of both second inversion minor and major chords. And it's from the first verse of the Red Hot Chili Peppers classic, Under the Bridge, where guitarist John Frusanti plays what would ordinarily be six string root bar chords, but he omits the six string roots. So check it out. So he starts off with this E chord and then plays a B chord over F sharp. And there's your major second inversion chord, right? Ordinarily, you would do this. So. Sneaks in a little Hendrix E hammer-ons. C sharp minor over G sharp. See, it's based upon the, the regular C sharp minor bar chord shape, but you're not barring your one. So we have. that same shape down to here. There's another second inversion minor. That's G sharp minor ordinarily, right? But we're not, we're intentionally leaving out the uh, bass note. There's A over E. So that's a second inversion major. And um, to me, I guess he did this, I'm thinking, because it, it sounds a little more sophisticated, less, um, less obvious, right? The chord progression, less, dare I say, primitive sounding, you know. You know. So it creates like an interesting bass line, kind of like what we looked at a couple lessons ago, uh, what Eddie Vedder did in um, Better Man by Pearl Jam. Right, those are first inversion major chords, okay? Now we just have first inversion, sorry, second inversion minor and major chords. Then he ends on a nice E major seven. And then on the second verse, when a band comes in, Flea's playing the root notes of the chords on bass. But it just sonically sounds great to not have the guitar double it. There's also the issue that sometimes, you know, just things don't ring as well on a guitar if you have certain notes like, that's fine, major bar chord, but this, maybe it rings better because you don't have that octave. Maybe you have slight intonation issues in your guitar, so you're kind of intentionally avoiding it. It's like, why do guitar players sometimes play A sus2 instead of A major or A minor? Because it's like, it's better intonated, you know? Sus2 chords can agree with a major or a minor. So that's another little tidbit.